Hey, everybody. This is the Secret Origins podcast. I'm Anna Toomey with Toomey Media, interviewing Nick Scovegard, CEO of Alter Ego Marketing. Nick, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, Anna. How are you? I'm doing good. I've really enjoyed our conversations. And we were talking last week about the Jackson CEO program. And I wanted to bring that back up again with you because as I did some research onto it, into it, this program's awesome. And, and what a great resource. I just kind of wanted you to recap what that program was for us and how you got involved in it. Oh, absolutely. So um, I actually was a speaker for the uh, Jackson County CEO program, and that's uh, done through the Midland Institute for Entrepreneurship. And I walked into this class and there's uh, probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 high school juniors and seniors. I spoke to the class about my business and about my entrepreneurial journey. And some of that's, I just remember leaving going number one, holy cow, those kids have their stuff together. And number two, where was this when I was in high school? Where where was this opportunity? And so a couple of years later, the facilitator who was an acquaintance of mine, um, who's now a close friend actually, basically retired and said, Nick, this is something right up your alley. You should consider it. And I originally went, nah, I'm good. I've got my own thing. I'm really, really busy. I don't have time for this. And I hard passed on it. And then the next year, the facilitator position came open again. And I just remember thinking like the media, as soon as I passed on it, I was kicking myself going, I, I should have been involved in that program. So anyways, I decided to throw my hat in the ring, got the position. And, and I basically from 7.30 to 9 a.m., five days a week for the next year, next three years, I taught a young entrepreneurship class. And what makes this class so incredibly different is that it's never, ever, it never takes place at a school. So it is always off campus. So we met at local businesses. We toured local businesses. And the overview is simply this. Over the course of a single year, these students will come together for an hour and a half, five days a week, in professional dress clothes. So they, I mean, no jeans ever, always slacks, always, you know, a nice polo, a nice dress shirt. And over the course of a single year, we would tour between 40 and 60 businesses within the community. We would have over 50 entrepreneurs come and tell their story to class. In the first half of the year, those students would come together as a group. They'd come up with an idea for a business and they would form, launch, and make a class business that would generate a real profit that would go in a real bank account that would become seed capital for them in the second half of the year. Then in the second half of the year, they would establish their own business plan. They'd write a business plan. They'd pitch that business plan to a real banker for a real loan that came out of our class fund. And then they would found their first company all before they turned 18 or graduated high school. And it is just the most mind blowing program ever Every single one of these kids is just coming out of high school, swinging for the fences with this network of like a hundred of the most connected people in their community. And the thing is just incredible. It is just the most powerful program I've ever seen. I know those are must be such motivated young people. I, I mean, that's just a skill, like from the get go, like getting into that mindset, at like under 20. I, I mean, when you see that happening, I mean, how much are these students going to benefit from it? And, and, and the benefits of getting into that entrepreneurial mindset that young. And one of my favorite parts about it is the facilitator, you know, I was involved with the board and sort of selecting the next year's class. And one of the things that we were trying very hard not to do is in a lot of programs in high school, the kids that are the most affluent, that, you know, already have the most accolades, that already or whatever, those are the people who run student government. Those are the people who are the jocks. Those are the people who are the valedictorians, right? They have these, these huge opportunities, right? And one of the things about CEO is we're really looking for that underdog. We're really looking for that kid who, who, who just doesn't quite fit into the school system. And if you were somebody who was really book smart and you could perform well in school and you, that, like that was your scene, like you did really well. But if you were somebody, and, and I fell into this category, who, who just didn't, I didn't love homework. I wasn't good at taking tests. I, I really, I resisted authority, right? That was, I was like, you can't tell me what to do. Those kids really struggle. And I, I've told the story before, but like I graduated high school thinking that I was dumb. I legitimately didn't think I was intelligent. And it was because the skills that I had weren't skills that work within the structure of school really well. So I didn't have good grades. I wasn't in the band. I wasn't athletic. 
And I just didn't know how to find what made me talented in, in a way that I could apply it to the real world. And that's what CEO does. I love that because I feel like so many people grow up looking at ways to compare all the time on social media and, and even young with academics. I mean, if you're not you know, the head of student government, and you're not making that 4.0, I can see how for folks, I mean, it just leads to this sagging confidence in a world that really prioritizes metrics. And so I, I love your thinking on that. And, and your thoughts on pursuing different avenues, not losing that faith, just because you're not meeting metrics that society has put on you. Well, here's, here's one really interesting point about the CEO program is you know, if you think back to our school system, sort of as a whole, across the board, let's say you're in, you know, whatever, you're in a writing class or something like that, you're you're doing okay, you, you're a fairly decent writer, and then one day you're like, you know what, I want to try something out of left field, and you try it, and it doesn't go well, like you fail, right? There's no program in high school, at least not that I can think of, where failing doesn't result in a bad grade that then you have to like claw your way back to is like, there's a risk. And so those risks in school are not rewarded at all. And the thing that's so great about CEO is it literally says, we don't care, right? We, we, we barely grade anything in the whole program. This is not for, you know, can you get an A? Can you get a B? You know, can you get a perfect on the store? Can you memorize something? That's not what it is at all. Like, we're encouraging, you know, risk and failure as learning tools because getting out of your comfort zone when you're 16, 17, 18, 19 years old is so important for you to feel like you have this ability to try something new and not to be good at it and not have it be detrimental to your career. That's so important because that's how you figure out where you want to go in life, isn't it? Absolutely. No, I'm with you. How did, what was your methodology in giving advice to these young folks or giving them input? How did you go about that? It's really interesting because the way that they kind of train the facilitators and they call them facilitators for a very specific reason is like, you're not a teacher, right? They, they would say in training, like if it looks like, smells like, feels like, tastes like school, it will not work. Like that's not what CEO is. And so one of my favorite examples is we, you know, we look at a, a sort of a, a mini business in the very beginning. It's the first couple of weeks of school. Students have to have a, a name badge, right? Either a lanyard or a, a name pin that has their information on it so that when we go on tours, they're easily identifiable. So you've got this lanyard as your facilitator and you walk up and you've got the kids, you know, probably sitting around a table and you're like, hey, you need these and you need to have them by whatever, two to three weeks out. And you chuck it on the table and you walk away. And it's amazing because there's this flurry of activity because they all think they have it figured out. What happens is they start looking at them and then somebody will open like Canva and start designing them and somebody will be Google searching things and they're going all at it. And they're like, okay, cool. We can order these from whatever this printer is online and we design them in Canva and they look great. It's like, okay, go ahead. Wow. They're like, oh, well, like, can we have your credit card? <laughs> no, you have to have them but you need to figure out a way to pay for them. They're going to be a couple hundred dollars. And unless you want to pony it up, you need to go figure out how you get the money. And it's so funny because nothing like that has ever happened to these students before, right? There's always like, hey, Anna, you're in whatever football or cheerleading or math lead. They're like, go sell these candy bars. And so like, if there's a fundraiser, it's like, it's already done for you. And yeah. these kids literally are like, wait, what? What? They're like, are you going to reimburse us? And it's like, no. And so what they figure out is that they need to sell sponsorships or, or find some way to deliver value. And one of the rules of CEO is you can't take a donation. So I can't walk in and go like, Anna, I need $500 for these. Can I just have it? You, I have to give you value in return. There's this like wild learning moment where like it is literally me at the back of the classroom. They're sitting around in a group trying to figure this out. And my job literally is to let them fail, to let them make as many mistakes as I can. And I think we had a year where they chose a really cheap printer. I think this was my second year. And they chose this really cheap printer and the price came back. And I just remember going like, there's no way. Like, this is, this is going to be terrible. Like, there's, this is, this is a disaster in the making. And the hardest thing ever is like, I had to just shut up. So they printed these name badges and they were like, somebody 
made them in their house off their crappy printer and like you know heat sealed them or whatever like laminated like a homemade laminate and it just it, they're giant and they look so stupid and the kids got them and they're like these look terrible and i was like yeah they look terrible you can't wear those and then you saw their wheels turning up like we've already gone to the sponsors we've already spent the money we can't get the money like what are we going to do and so ceo becomes this like really like heavy problem solving class go figure it out like as adults you don't have all the answers and i think the sooner you realize that as a kid like there's something there's a real power in that absolutely no i love that that whole program seems super on point super effective i was curious if there was like in your time as the facilitator, if there was like one lesson or one moment that you saw like, okay, this is the most effective lesson for these kids. I, I love that story about the badge, but I'm curious the biggest lesson that just came out of it that you noticed. So several of them that kind of hold true if you think of like the arc of the whole year, right? Because, because I think that one of the things that happens is very often people figure out in the class that like, not knowing the answer is okay and that everybody kind of has this imposter syndrome and that if they if they mess up it's going to be okay and so like there's a lot of lessons around that that, that are around like quotes and things like that but my, one of my favorite is my first year i brought back this idea from another program called the one to 100 challenge and so literally i walk into class one day they have no idea this is coming and i have seven seventeen one dollars and I walk around the class and I hand them each a $1 bill. And then I explain the rules. You have 14 days to turn $1 into $100 by buying low and selling high. There are only two rules. It has to be legal and it has to be ethical. That's it. That's all the guidance you get. And in 14 days, you have to bring $100 back to the class. Now, in true CEO fashion, that's the class's money. So we ended up with, I think, $1,700, whatever it was, and that got used by the class to make a purchase for the class. So it's not like I get that money. But I remember students going like, this is impossible. Like, this is never going to happen. Like, that's nuts. There's no way to do this. And then I remember, like, I think it was like day three or day four, I had the first student come back in and, and show up with $100. and the whole class is like floored. And then another one comes in, another one comes in. And then like, we're like 12 days in. So like this, this challenge is almost over. And I have kids who still have their original $1. They have $1 and they have no ideas. And they're like, can't do this. And I'm like, yes, you can, you can do it. So in the three years I was facilitator, not one single time did a student not complete the one to 100 challenge? Not mm -hmm. once. Every student did it, including people who went like at that $1 at day 12, no idea at all. We brainstorm and they would go out and figure it out. And it was so powerful to watch these kids show up with that $100 just beaming because they figured out a way to solve what felt like an impossible problem in a way that they would never have the opportunity to solve it in a, in a classroom. There's some really cool lessons in that. Absolutely. And I was curious, the ones who were successful, are those that are just thinking outside of the box more? Or I mean, who who were those that were successful it was, it was, fast? It was funny because they were all successful. One of the young ladies, Miranda, I, I think she'll be okay with me telling on her, who was the most like timid. She literally looked at me when I gave her that dollar and said, like, I'm not doing this. There's no way. She's incredibly shy, you know, the very like high C personality, very rules oriented, very high S, very stable. You can't upset her. I just remember her going like, there's, there's, I can't do this. There's no way. My favorite part about that is she set the record for the highest one to 100 challenge. I want to say it was more than $1,000. She turned $1 into like more than $1,000 in 14 days. And it's like she just unlocked this little secret of like, oh, that's how you generate money. And it was so interesting to watch her figure out that the rules that like you, you're kind of like you live by, there's all these like unwritten rules, these things that you do because that's the way you do them, because that's how it works. And as soon as you figure out that like, okay, well, and I, I see that you believe in this rule, but like, where does it come from? And you're like, I, I don't know. I just, I just, I just, I just thought that's how you did it. And it's like, okay, cool. Well, 
why? And they're like, I have no idea. That's just how I've always done it. And getting them to just like rewire those pieces in their brain of like, oh, to tell you how she did it, she took orders, right? So she took orders and got paid up front. So she was making tie blankets and she put it out to all of her family and said, if you want a blanket, they're, I don't know, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. And so they would pay her and she hadn't done any of the work yet, but she was getting these orders. And then I think it went to her church and then it went to her, her aunt's church. And pretty soon she has like all of these orders for these blankets. Now she has all this money. She still has to do the work, but she had done the math. I mean, they were very profitable and the idea that you could ask for for money from someone for an order that you were going to fulfill was so foreign to her, but yet we do it every day. I mean, you pay for your Amazon order before they ship it. That's not weird at all, but it's just like no one ever gave her permission to do that. And so that's so much fun. And I feel like that's a skill that will apply for life almost. You know, I I completely see what you mean about the systems and the rules. You know, I find myself in that all the time where it's like, oh, well, it should be done. Nobody else has tried that. But I feel like that's kind of at the core of your philosophy and even your business is just, I mean, what rules, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah well, and, and who says, right? Uh, we use a, a, a program called the DISC, the D-I-S-C. Um, so that's a personality profile. And one of the things that's really funny is like my DISC score is like off the charts on one side. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with the DISC results. Are you at all? I'm not. I should try it though. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll show you how to take the, the quiz. It's really interesting. There's a bunch of these, but like D, D is like decisive, right? So just think yeah. like, people who are really action oriented. I is very like outgoing. So a high I score means you're very social. Um, a high C score means you're you're kind of like a rule follower. You like stability, you like structure, you like understanding the process. And a high S score is like how easily you can get excited. So a really high S is somebody like who is unshakable. Like the earthquake hits and they don't even move. Like they're just focused. So I am a 99D, 99I, so highly outgoing, highly sort of decisive, and my C score is like a 17, like it's through the floor. And so I take this quiz, and I get these results, and I literally hand them to my wife at home, and she's reading them. And by the time she's done, she has tears rolling down her face. She is laughing so hard at my score. But like one of the most memorable ones is like C, my 17 score C is like, you do not like rules. It's accurate. Because I felt like the structures that really help some people really hurt me, especially in school. And it wasn't that I was just like this problem child. It was, it was, hey, Nick, you have to do this. And my answer was like, why? Why do I have to do that? Who says I have to do that? Who, what, what's this rule for? Who came up with this rule? And I've always had this joke, and I, I'm going to ask you this question legitimately. Let's say you're driving on a desert highway, right? You've got <laughs> your, your car, you're on vacation, you're in a desert highway, and you can see 100 miles in every single direction. 100 miles. There's no one around you. Flat is just absolutely flat. As you're tearing through the desert, there's a stop sign. Do you stop? For me, yeah, I would. So like, I and like that's been driving through the desert, <laughs> right? But like, so so for me, like, I would never even lift my foot <laughs> off the gas. Like the idea that that stop sign is there, it does not apply to me because I understand what a stop sign's for, but yeah. I can clearly see there's no reason to stop zero. Right, and so. Yeah. So for me, it's like, okay, well, cool. I understand that rules, you know, usually exist for a reason, but but in a lot of structures, like, you know, companies you work for, bosses you work for, sometimes those rules don't make any sense and they don't need to apply to you. And so I believe in, in teaching my kids, especially to, to just simply question the authority, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, to be a jerk. It doesn't have to be, to be a bad kid, but really to like, where does this come from? Why does it exist? What happened? And it doesn't mean that you have to break them all, but it does mean that it's important to pay attention to who's making the rules that you're following. And probably most importantly, why do they exist, right? Who came up with that rule? And is that a rule that you choose to follow because you respect the person putting it in place? Or is that a rule that you follow that is not okay to be a rule put in place by somebody who doesn't have the power to create it or enforce it. 
And so I'm, I'm going to tangent really quickly, and I'm going to tell you one of my favorite stories. <laughs> so when I was at SIU, there was a professor named Professor Lanigan, and he taught a group called uh, a small group communication, and it was uh, called RTF, roundtable format, and basically how small groups coordinate. Professor Lanigan was, uh, did you ever see the movie Office Space? Yes, I he love the, that the movie. Stapler guy, right? He was just <laughs> kind of this really eccentric looking, kind of goofy guy. And you walked in the first day of class and like, this is no one's major, right? Like if, even if communications, which was my major is like your interest, no one's going to go like, this is the thing that's going to get you the job. And so this, this kind of like, you know, very unique looking kind of old cadre looking dude is standing up in front of class. And I'll never forget this. He, he said, just so you know, if you're trying to protect your GPA, drop my class right now because you're not going to get an A in my class. And I remember there was a couple of girls around me that were like those like valedictorian, like straight A, hey. super A type personalities that are like kind of laughing nervously. And you could see them going, hey. this guy's serious. I guess we do something like that. He issues this test and it was like, okay, and uh, question number four, name two out of the five communication types of a uh, roundtable format, N name two of the five roles. And so there's two little blanks and this text is eight and a half by 11, wall to wall, there's no space. And you put your two in there, they were pretty easy to remember, turn in your test. Next day we come in and like, there are people crying in class, like full, full tears because the two out of five congratulations, you lost points on that question. There are five, you named two, you got a C on the test, good job. You got every question right, C, that's average. Great job, you did exactly what was asked of you. And he literally stood there and said like, in this world, if you're going to do exactly what's asked of you, you are a C student, you're not an A student, you're not a high achiever, you're average. You got the average expectation. And I will never forget that because it was this really powerful lesson. The other thing that Professor Lanigan taught me, it ties back to the rules, is yeah. really early on, probably the second day of class, he walks up to the board and he draws four lines on the board, right? A classic tic-tac-toe. And I'm incredibly competitive. It's like one of my greatest personality flaws. I'm just wildly competitive about stupid things. And he's like, who wants to play? And I'm like, me pick me I want to play and so I walk up there and like not only am I competitive but I'm fairly good at tic-tac-toe I'm like I'm not gonna lose so I walk up there I put an x he puts an O. he's barely paying attention to so I put an x I'm trying to like trap him uh he puts an O. I put an x and we're going towards a cats game right so I get uh, my last x down and he walks over to the board and all the spaces are filled and he draws an O, draws three lines, and goes, I win. Go sit down. And I'm like, what do you tell? What do you mean you win? Right? Like your O's not on the board. That's like that's not how you play. And he goes, I'm really glad you said that. Nick, what game were we playing? And I go, tic-tac-toe. He goes, who said? <laughs> and I go, it's tic-tac-toe. And he goes, okay, but did we talk about the rules? I go, no. He goes, I win. We didn't discuss the rules. What says that I can't do that? I was like, well, that's, that everybody knows the rules of tic-tac-toe. And he goes, exactly. He goes, that's the lesson you're going to learn out of this class is you assume that everybody in every room is playing by the same rules that you are because you know the rules that you were taught and you expect that they know the same rules. And the, the really catastrophic part of, you know, the way we communicate is that Nobody discusses those rules. We didn't discuss the rules for this conversation. How, what is the norm? What is okay? What's not appropriate? And if you don't have those conversations, then how can you possibly know what Anna thinks the rules of these conver this conversation is? We didn't talk about it. And no, I that love that. Lord me. <laughs> Most valuable lesson of my college career. Yeah. No, I love that because, you know, as a self-proclaimed rule follower, I, that learning that is it's huge when you actually think about it, even right now sitting and thinking, it's like, well, well, you don't have to do it that way. Is that, you know, it's like, it's crazy. It's like such a huge concept, to be honest. It's like when you think like, okay, there's only one path and it's in everything you do though. And the way you live, it's like a way of life, what you're well, describing. 
and, and perfect example, right? We're having this conversation. You've got a background in news. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's fucking crazy. You're going, whoa, well, you can't say that. Like, that's not okay. You can't say that in an interview. Why not? <laughs> like, who's that? Like, this isn't rated PG. We're not, we're going to send this out on the Disney channel. And so, like, I just think that that's so fun to recognize of, like, okay, whose rules are these? And why do I believe these things to be true? And so CEO was so good at kind of like just unwinding that mentality of like, why do you believe the things that you believe? Why do you do the things that you do? Who says you can't be a company owner? Who says you can't found your first company at 16 years old? The answer is, well, well nobody else is doing it. It's like, okay, cool. That doesn't stop you. Absolutely. No, I love that. No, and on that note, I wanted to ask kind of, you know, thinking about young people and getting into that mindset, going into the workforce, like advice you ha would have for young people about what to look for in an employer. And like, as they're scouting out these jobs, I mean, things that you would look for if you found yourself out looking for a job again. So one of the things that's so, so interesting about entrepreneurship is I think that once you have a real taste of entrepreneurship, it's really hard to do anything else. There's, there's a lot of risk that goes with it, but there's a lot of freedom that goes with it too. And so the advice that I would give comes from a piece of social media content that I found early in my career, which is figure out what you want to do with your life. Like what's, what's that crazy dream? The thing that is just, is just so big that it would just like be the best thing to ever happen to you. And, and I don't care if that's your world, it would be, you know, anchoring something like that. If it's me, it's some, this massive marketing company doing these amazing campaigns, whatever it is, it's like figure out who's living your dream life and find a way to get in the room with them. Because if you can get a seat at the table, hell, if you can't get a seat at the table, the delight is if you can't get a seat at the table, serve water, Figure out a way to get adjacent to the table and find that person who's living your dream life and just tell them, like, I will come work for you for free for 90 days. And if at the end of 90 days, I am not so indispensable that you cannot afford to lose me, then hire me, right? If I can't make myself that valuable, pay me. I don't even care what, but what I want is I want access and I want to learn from you. Give me that opportunity. Go find that person. Because the thing that I, I, have, I have found about successful people through the CEO program is there are so many incredibly successful people that are so willing to give back, to teach. They want to show you the way. And if you can just find a way to, to earn it, right? You can't be lazy. They're not going to do it for you. But if you can find a way to earn it, they will give you so much access. Hi, this is Nick. I'm a sophomore at SIU. I'm studying marketing. And I was wondering if there's any way that I could buy you a cup of coffee and just, just ask you some questions about the, what the field looks like. Call number two. Hey, Anna, thank you so much for letting me you know, sit down with you for that half an hour. I thought it was indispensable. I hope you got the thank you card that I sent you. I was just curious, you know, is there any chance that I could come job shadow you for an afternoon? Like I'll, I'll, I'll stay out of the way. I would just love to see what a real day looks like for you. Anna, thank you so much for letting me job shadow you. I'm so impressed by what you're doing. I'm so impressed by your company. Do you ever offer internships or anything? I'd be I'd be willing to work for free if, if that was what it would take. I would really like to learn from you. That is your golden ticket. Find a way to do that. And if you can find a way to do it getting paid, do it. But like, I can't emphasize this enough. Money doesn't matter. The money will come. Find the knowledge, find the skill, get in the room where people are doing cool things. And you will always figure, find yourself like leveling up. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think people forget that people want to help. Like you said, I mean, I forget that a lot too. And I remember as student days, like with networking specifically, being very anxious to ask for help, feeling like I'm not important enough. Like, I mean, I'm going to basically be impeding this person's time. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence in case you're going to tell them. It's like, you know, I don't want to ask this person because I'm so afraid of being shot down, but they actually want to help. <laughs> I, I'd like to drive this point all the way home. Hey, Anna, I couldn't tell. 
I would have never guessed that you didn't have a ton of self-confidence growing up. <laughs> you carry yourself very well. You speak very well. You've been on the news. You've been in front of thousands of people. I would never guess. And I think like that's such a great illustration of me, you, everybody. Everybody struggles with that here, like that imposter syndrome of like, what if they figure out I don't have any idea what I'm doing? What if they figure out that I don't know, I, I'm not that great about that? What if they figure out I don't I don't have a million dollars in my bank account? What if they figure out I'm not the smartest marketing guy in the world? Like we all have that fear, but the difference is like, there are some people that that just paralyzes them. And I think that the older that you get, the more you you understand that like when you say yes to things or or when you you step out of your comfort zone, like it all works out. Like it it goes pretty well. And even when you fall on your face, you get back up. But like you said, you're like you weren't super confident. And so you would like, um, what if I impede on this person? And I think that has so much to do with like knowing what you want. So when I work with students through SIU, Something that happens a lot is like a student will be like, yeah, I'm getting a degree in marketing. I'm like, okay, cool. What's the dream job? And they're like, well, I don't know. Cool. Well, good luck. I can't help you. If you said to me, Nick, the thing I want to do more than anything in the world is I want to work a technology-based company that does, you know, campaigns. I really want to live in the city. I love, you know, St. Louis and Chicago and, you know, LA would be a dream. I really like that. I really like to be marketing something that, you know, a, a fun product, you know, sports cars or something like that. Do you know anybody who does cool stuff like that? And my answer might be like, no, I don't know anything off the top of my head, but I do know someone I can ask. And so like when you're clear on at least some of that goal and some of that dream, even if you don't know the pathway, even if you don't know the skills you need, you've given me the ability to go like, oh, Anna, you're really good at this. You'd be great for that. Let me see if I can put you in touch with my friend, Joel, who works at uh, Yellow Dog Productions in St. Louis. They have some really big ticket client accounts. They have some cool stuff going on. He's been a, a really great you know, contact. Let me see if I can put you in touch. That introduction is worth a million dollars to the right person at the right time. But I can't make that introduction for you if I don't know anything about you because you don't know anything about you. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I feel like a lot of what you've talked about and the advice is like so important. You think about it most when you're like young, right? Early 20s and stuff. And I'm curious your thoughts. And I guess, you know, even just comments for people who middle of their career find themselves pivoting. I feel like I've talked to a lot of folks recently that are like, I was doing this job and I thought I was that 20 year old that said, yes, this is what I want to do. And I'm pumped. And then 10 years later, you're back to the drawing board. I mean, thoughts to those folks who find themselves later kind of back at the beginning. I love that question because it aligns so perfectly like with this, this these unwritten rules, right? Well, I went to school and I got a degree in radio and television and I wanted to go this pathway and, and I started down the pathway and then I was like, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Like that doesn't sound fun or, or, or that, that those hours suck and I have kids and I have stuff to do. And like, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I feel like there's this unwritten rule of like, oh, I got a degree in marketing. I have to work in marketing or, oh, I got a degree in this. I have to do this. And it, I just have to keep going. Why? Who says like, where's that rule written? There are so many great stories. And I think, I think Warren Buffett is one of them. Like I think Warren Buffett, I think Bill Gates is one of them. Like these guys that like, they didn't make their first million dollars till after they were 40 years old. And there's so much pressure on 17 year olds, 16, 17 year olds. Like this is something we talk about all the time. It's like, what are you going to do with your life? I remember being a kid and I was, uh, I was getting ready to graduate high school. And, and I would have all these adults that knew my parents that would come up and be like, Hey, Nick, where are you going to go to college? What do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would be like, oh, I don't know. And they'd be like, you really need to figure that out, Nick. Like you're, you're you got to figure that out before you go to college. Cause you can't pick a college unless you know what you want to be. I'm like, shit. I have no idea. I remember, I can't, I wish I could remember what it was, but I decided one day I was just going to lie to somebody through my teeth. I go, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, oh, pilot. And they were like, wow, that's a great choice. Good idea, Nick. And then they shut up and they left. And I remember, I, I wish I remembered what it was, but it was something I couldn't care less about. And I told everyone for two years, this like bold faced lie about this job I wanted to do. And I remember having a parent, like a conversation with my parents and like, they're like, oh, you want to be a pilot? I was like, no, I just tell people that. So they will go away. 
because we put all this pressure on. So like if you're 17 or 35 or 65, who says you can't start back over? There's so much opportunity in the world. And, you know, one thing that I took away from my mentor is that this idea of, you know, especially when you're young, you keep scored by money. I have a, a nice house. I have the X salary. I have, you know, whatever car, whatever it is. And that's a real, a real like mistake. Money isn't the currency. The only currency is time. And the intentionality that you get to wake up every day and do something that you're good at, that you care about, that you want to do, and then you get to spend time with your family or with your kids, that's crazy, right? There's not enough money in the world to pay me to do certain jobs. I don't want that. I want freedom. I want the privilege of choice. That's what I want. And I think when you figure that out, that, okay, I could work really hard, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. I could climb that corporate ladder. I could have some retirement when I'm done, but I'm not going to retire till I'm 50, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be miserable the whole time, all the best years of my life, all, all of the, like, my kids growing up, all of that. I'm going to be working late. I'm going to be hustling. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to hate my life. I'm going to hate my eight hours a day. I'm going to hate them. Okay, well, cool. We'll make less money and, and, and find a way to work 20 hours a week and do something you love and live below your means, right? It's such a better quality of life. Absolutely. And kind of believing you can find the solution. That's another thing I'd add to your little list of <laughs> mantras. I feel like whatever position you are in in life, you know, and you lost your job, you're changing jobs or something happened in life with your health, whatever, whatever issue, it's just that having that determination and saying, yeah, I can do it, the confidence and a little bit of that rule breaking and saying, yeah, I can myself. So, so there's this quote, um, every entrepreneur believes two things. They believe that tomorrow has the power to be better than today. And they believe that they have the power to make it so. And I think that like, we get kind of focused on like, oh, I got to solve this problem, right? I got to get to this place. But I don't know about you in your career, but this is extremely true of me and mine, which is like, I remember being, you know, 17, 18, 20, 25, early 30s and going like, if I just, I will have made it. If I just, you know, I remember at one point, like I wanted to be an award-winning agency. Like that was so important to me. And I have no idea why. It's like, <laughs> I just wanted to be able to be like, oh, we're alter ego. We're an award-winning agency, whatever the hell that means. Well, today we're an award-winning agency. We got a stack of Addies back there. It's wonderful. You know what? Not one person cares. No one. No one's ever paid me more money. You know, at one point we won the, the best, the Reader's Choice Award for the best marketing agency in Southern Illinois. And I remember winning it. And like, I was so competitive. I was going to win this. And then I got it. I was like, this feels icky. I don't even want to put it on my social media profile. I don't even want to like talk about it. No one cares. And so like at some point, there's some credibility indicators that will help you. But really, if you come to my company and you're hiring somebody to do your marketing, and I have this amazing portfolio and this awful, tremendous list of clients, and I'm amazing at what I do, you're like, yeah, have you won any awards? Like, no, look at, look at the work. It speaks for itself. It's amazing. And you're like, yeah, but have you won any awards? No, if you buy those, they're not, they're not even that important. It's just so funny. Like we, we feel like we've got to like reach this goal or solve this problem. And, and, and really it's like, how do you just get a little bit better every day? How do you, how do you grow your career? How do you make a little bit more money? Or how do you make the same amount of money working a little less hours? That's so powerful. You're never going to have it all figured out. You're never going to have enough money. You're never going to have enough time. You make the most of what you got and, and improve tomorrow. Absolutely. No, I love that mantra. It makes me laugh of nobody cares because I literally tell myself that every day. It's like nobody cares. And that leads me right into my next question because I wanted to ask you about your TED talk at SIU and the process of that. And like, there's an example of like, don't psych yourself out and not do it. Nobody cares. You get up there and you make the effort. And so back to my question is more, I wanted to ask you kind of like what inspired you to do it and what got you through it? You know, I'm assuming there was some nerves trying to do something yeah. like that. 
I wish, I wish Friday, who runs my company, was here to hear that, that statement. <laughs> I, there was probably some nerve. Yeah, there's something like that. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to give a TED Talk. And I've really wanted to give a TED Talk because I, because I was inspired by one of my heroes. His name, a guy by the name of Drew Dudley. So Drew Dudley gave this uh, TED Talk called Everyday Leadership. And that is that is literally the reason my company exists. It is literally the reason that I became the facilitator of the CEO program. They can trace so many things back to this. And so he gives this amazing TED Talk that just really talks about like being a leader and redefining that word and like figuring out that like no matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter where your your education level or whatever, like you have leadership qualities and you should be a leader right now. Quit making it about something more than what it actually is. And I just remember thinking, you know, that TED Talk and then Simon Sinek gave one called the Golden Circle or the Start With Why. And, you know, those two TED Talks were like defining for me. Like they they really, the early young Nick, that, that is my personality is built off of those two TED Talks. It was this, this concept of like, if I could have the type of impact on someone else that Drew Dudley had on me, holy shit, that would be the greatest thing ever. Like that would be the coolest moment of my life. And I really did think, you know, going into it, even, you know, in the, the daydream stage that I was going to give a TED talk and then like millions of people were going to watch it and they would learn something great and think great things about me. And, and, and really like, no one cares. No one cares. I got some really great feedback and, and, and really it was super meaningful. I'm really glad that I did it. But on the grand scheme of things, no one cares. I don't have a flood of clients. I don't have millions of viewers. I don't have a sponsorship deal yet. Uh, still working on that. But like, it, it's just not what I thought it was going to be. But what it was is the, the most pressure I've ever put on myself for any single activity I've ever done. So I worked harder on that TED Talk than on anything else I've done in my entire life. I was scared out of my ever-loving mind not because I'm afraid of failing, but afraid of like missing my moment, right? Like afraid of getting up there and having the opportunity to make a difference for somebody else. And then like not doing it, like just, like, yeah, that was okay. That terrified me. The reason why I laugh so hard at the some nerves comment is, is like I had, I had crazy amounts of nerves. Well, but I don't know if you know this about TED Talks, but the day before a TED Talk, they do a full dress rehearsal where they run the entire TED Talk top to bottom, floor to ceiling, just like it's like the, like the audience is there. And so I think I was, I was fourth or fifth in the lineup. And so like, you're wearing the clothes you're going to wear tomorrow. So they can have all the mics set up and they, they basically have you deliver it just like you're going to deliver it on stage. And what they do is they capture all this like B-roll footage. So that way, if they need to cut in or if they have a sound issue, they have a backup of your whole speech. And so like, I'm hiding in the back room, just rehearsing my speech. I probably put 500 hours of this TED Talk. I had no idea. It was it was egregious. All day, every day, I didn't do anything else. And so the night before the TED Talk, or the, 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 the night of the dress rehearsal, I get there and it gets to me and they mic you up and I go up on stage and I get two lines into my TED Talk. Just bomb. And I know the people who are putting on the TED Talk and I, I know them well enough to know like their faces and they're going like, uh-oh. <laughs> Uh oh, we, I know that we, look. <laughs> we screwed up. And I consider myself a pretty good speaker. Like I'm somebody who's very comfortable. Yes. I'm not good memorized. Like I don't memorize my speeches. I don't memorize my lines, but I wanted to be able to deliver a speech. So I memorized this whole thing. So they're like, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. You're a little nerves, whatever. It's start up. So I walk off stage or walk back on stage, two lines into it, bomb. Just no words. Nothing's coming out of my mouth nothing. There's a kid at the very back who's like flipping his arms around the whole thing. He's spotlighted. I'm so distracted. I am ready to like crawl in a hole and die. Like I was so ready to cry. Elizabeth took me out. We, we practiced it a couple times in the lobby, struggling, just struggling to remember. I go home. I don't sleep at all. I did nothing but drill this speech all night long. The next morning, my kids wake up and I'm giving the speech and I'm literally at one point, my daughter's throwing things at me. She's like throwing an apple to me. At one point, I've got all four of my kids sitting in front of me, like making faces at me, trying to distract me. And I'm trying to deliver the speech. I probably gave that speech I've, 50 times between 
nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night when I got home and the next day. So I get up there and I, I do a I do a good job, right? I, I I got all the way through the speech. I had it all memorized, but I was I was convinced that I was going to bomb in front of everyone. And so I got done and I got some some really good feedback, but like it has made any difference in my life other than now today. I know I'm capable of putting that much focused effort into one single thing that I care about. And that for me makes all the difference. I don't care if nobody ever watches it. It doesn't matter at all. Um, I did find out. So um, on Thursday, I went up to Erie, Illinois, and I met another one of my idols. So Drew Dudley is one of my idols. Um, another one is Neil Ford, uh, F-O-A-R-D, fantastic speaker. Drove up to Erie, Illinois, met this guy. He has the most heartwarming reaction to seeing me. Like, it was like he drove there to meet me. Like he was so excited to see me. And I am just like freaking out because I think this, I think the world of this guy, like this is like celebrity status to me. Uh, after the show, we go back to the guy who invited him in town and we're sitting on this porch, just sitting on like, you know, lawn chairs chatting. And he like casually references like, yeah, I, I watched your Ted talk. It was really good. And like, you, you what? Like you see my Ted talk? Like how? How in what universe does this take place? And so like, if no one else on the planet watches my TED talk, he's like, yeah, you did a good job. Like, I, I'm trying to think like, if you're a music fan and you play music and Taylor Swift's like, yeah, I saw that song you did. It was really good. I'm just starstruck, like the coolest moment of my life. But who cares? Go do it. Like, what's the worst that's gonna happen? Right. No, I love this harrowing journey of the TED Talk because it's the real. There's so many like lessons in that good that came out like that. No, this is great. And and I wanted to ask you about your basically those 24 hours before after so after you did your practice and then and that moment I relate to that. I, I mean, a lot of people do whatever industry you're in. It's just like where you know something's coming. You're worried about what you said missing your moment. It's like how to handle that in a productive way. I don't think you can ever take away all of your nerves, but handling that better. I want to I want to make sure that I say right here that we did not discuss this beforehand, right? This segue was not <laughs> planned in any way. It was not. <laughs> so Neil Ford has this amazing video about a bartender. It's a story where basically he goes up and he's, he's pitching to all these car dealers and it's like the most important pitch of his career so far. And it, all of his bosses are there. And he's like, I got up there and I just choked. I choked in every way possible. I just bombed so bad that I wasn't sure I was going to have a job tomorrow. And he goes, I get back to the hotel and I'm just, my nerves are shot. I can't sleep. I go down to the bar. Um, you know, the bar is basically like, we're the only person in there, me and the bartender. And um, he starts talking to the bartender and the story he tells is, um, you know, he discovers that she's got a tattoo on her palm and I can't pronounce the Russian word. He goes, what does the tattoo mean? And she says, you know, 20,000 years ago, you know, we learned to, to freak out over danger. We learned to freak out over everything because the odds were good that you were going to be, you were going to fall through the ice and die, or you were going to be attacked by a bear or a tiger and eaten, eaten. And like, like you learn to freak out every time there's a hint of danger. But 23,000 years later, we have a be bad meaning and we freak out, right? We, we choke on our, our TED Talk practice or we bomb on a sales presentation or we fumble over our word. We, you know, lose our job and like, you know, we, we freak out and, and why? And so the tattoo says there is no tiger, right? There's nothing to be afraid of. What's the worst that's going to happen? I bomb on a TED Talk and everybody laughs at me for a couple of days and they don't put it online and nobody cares. And I go back to my, like, that doesn't influence anything. And so like this idea that like, what are we so afraid of in failing or making a mistake? And another one of my, my heroes is a guy by the name of Zay Frank. And he just talks about like when the people that we love fail, or they make a mistake, or they do something stupid. Do you stop loving them? Do you stop caring about them? Of course not. If your mom or or your husband or wife, you know, did something stupid, you don't you don't stop caring about them. You you forgive them, you encourage them, you build them back up. But when we fail, right? When we fail internally, what what's the first thing that goes through your head? Ah, Nick, you're so stupid. Why'd you do that? You're an idiot. Why you're always doing stupid things, right? We we just 
assassinate ourselves. And so this idea of like, remember that love and that encouragement and that understanding that you, you give someone you care about most and just yeah. extend it to yourself. No, I love that. No, I because it's like, when you think about it, it's like, you know, you're a person who has to go up and give a presentation and you're feeling that nervousness. You know, I always like to think about like when I'm watching somebody else and how much I don't care and I'm just like, it's fine. Like I, you're not realizing the people who are watching you just are not seeing and hearing the same thing you are. But getting to that point is difficult though. Like trying to pull yourself out of that space. It, it's a big challenge. I had this experience that just kind of that was such an interesting one. You, you've done that thing, I'm sure, where like you're, you go to take a drink of water and you just miss your mouth and it just goes everywhere, <laughs> yes. right? Yes, many times. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes it's just like you just like it just runs down your chin and you're yeah. in a crowded cafeteria or you're in high school and like you have that moment of just like exploding sheer panic where you look up and like, you know, your one friend down at the end of the table is like, <laughs> and you just you got stuff all over your face. But like, Really, I, that that panic comes from it. Like it feels like everybody just saw that. Oh my God! Like I'm going to be a leper. Nobody's going to want to talk to me. It's so embarrassing. And like one person saw it, and two days later, they won't even remember it happened. We build that up in ourselves so much, and it's so unnecessary. I just think that like the sooner that you figure out in life that like the quote that we talked about last time is like. You know, failure isn't the opposite of success. It's the shortcut. The sooner you fail, the faster you fall on your face, the faster you get out of your comfort zone, the faster you learn those lessons that you will never forget. Just go fail a bunch of times. I guarantee you, you will be successful. Right. It's not as big of a deal as you think it is. No, I love that. And getting out of that headspace, I think, is, is can be great for people, especially those that find it more difficult to get up and do presentations to and it's not even about being a public speaker it's like functioning in today's yeah. workplace is hard you know yeah. <laughs> no Nick that was great we're coming up on our hour here um a couple of fun ones you know I always wanted to ask you some fun ones if you had any fun shows you're watching right now or favorite TikTok audio or trends what are you watching right now Ooh, so uh right now I'm I'm probably watching uh the Witcher uh just finished that one uh that was, that's a Ever great that's good. um really sad that it's uh it's a uh, transitioning its actor that's really unfortunate I, I don't spend a lot of time you know watching TV I I spend a lot of time on social media but more often yeah. I'm looking for content what I what I work on probably more than anything else is like curating the things around me so that I'm I'm finding people who are teaching. I'm finding motivation. I'm finding things that inspire me. And it's, it's by no means perfect, but I go out of my way to try and curate those feeds to get rid of that, that negative, toxic crap. I, I just, the, I don't have time for it in my life. It, it, it steals joy. And I feel like finding the things that make you happy, finding the things that inspire you, finding the things that make you better. If you can find somebody you care about and want to learn from, and you can just consume everything they put out, there's a lot that you can learn completely free these days. And, and I think that, you know, finding what, 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 where you want to curate that feed is, is, is really important. That was great, Nick. Love it. Well, awesome. I, I have a, I feel like there's so much more I want to ask you and we'll continue next week then. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate it. This was fun. See ya. <laughs> Bye. Bye.